uh, welcome everybody to the seminar for the Friday afternoon from the Department of Geology, Geography, and Environmental Studies from Calvin University. I'd like to welcome everybody who is joining us now live or later in the recording. And I am uh, delighted to be able to introduce today's uh, speaker and today's topic to everybody. Um, so Caitlin Etienne is a person who I met when she was a student at Calvin College, uh, back when we were still called Calvin College, in the environmental studies uh, major. And uh, I enjoyed um, getting to know Caitlin in courses and also as part of a research project that she was doing with uh, Dune Research uh, in her last year. And Caitlin had uh, done interesting things as a, a student here, including uh, going to Ghana uh, and uh, in the semester abroad. Um, after graduating, Caitlin had an opportunity to join the Peace Corps. And I'm not gonna say much about that because you're gonna tell us all about that. Um, after coming back from the Peace Corps, Caitlin is looking into graduate programs and is also working right now as a regulatory analyst. And if some of those things are interesting to people in the audience, you could certainly ask questions about them after the presentation. Uh, but for now, we'd love to hear from Caitlin talking about serving with the Peace, serving with Peace Corps Philippines in the coastal resource management sector. Um, although the virtual environment is a strange one, Caitlin, assume that people are cheering wildly uh, behind all those names that you're seeing on your screen right now. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction, and uh, I hope people can see my screen now. <laughs> yep, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so thank you so much uh, for inviting me to share. Um, I really enjoy talking about my Peace Corps service, and um, yeah, it's exciting to see folks uh, showed up today, and feel free to ask any uh, questions as I'm going along if if something pops into your head. Um, it, it's got, uh, I think I might talk a little bit uh, on each of the slides. I like to, I get excited about the topic. So feel free to stop me if you have a question or there's something else that comes up. Um, yeah, so I was asked to share about my um, US Peace Corps experience. I got back about a year and a half ago. I served from 2017 to 2019. And I joined about a year after I graduated from Calvin as an environmental studies major. Um, in the Philippines, I was paired with a local government unit that was very active. And you can see uh, in the picture, my coworkers and I'm in the green, I had short hair then. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about them. So I guess I'll go over first, what's the, what is the Peace Corps? How I decided to volunteer and then go into the service projects and talk about a little bit about what's been going on since I returned. Oh, if anyone is unfamiliar with the US Peace Corps too, um, it's a program for US citizens to partner with organizations overseas on different community development projects. So that's what this was all about. And here's some pictures of me. Um, I was an environmental studies major, did some dunes research with Professor Van Dyke. Um, up there in the top right, that's me while studying abroad in Ghana. Um, on that semester abroad program, they had a, an internship component. And so that was a cool opportunity. I got assigned um, with another Calvin student to do our internship at World Vision. And that was my first uh, chance to kind of see in action what a community development organization does kind of on the day to day. And it got me really interested in learning more. And then right after Calvin, I, I applied for AmeriCorps, um, an AmeriCorps in Knoxville, Tennessee called CAC AmeriCorps. It's at the time that I went, it was all an environmental corps and there's a bunch of different um, placements that they had. And that was a really cool experience just to kind of see examples of what types of work were available for somebody with an environmental background. And in that picture, we we're doing benthic uh, macroinvertebrate surveys. We were assigned to a municipal stormwater office. So that was mainly our work there. Okay. 
a little bit of background about the Peace Corps. Um, they just celebrated their 60th anniversary this month. Um, an interesting story is that JFK actually introduced the Peace Corps at an impromptu speech to college students at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And then in the following year, he signed it into through executive order to establish the program. Fast forward to today, um, we've got more than 240,000 Americans have served stationed among 142 host countries. Peace Corps has expanded and they have um, Peace Corps, which is two years of service. Um, people can serve directly out of usually uh, college, but the, the minimum requirements are that you be 18 years of age and a US citizen. Um, and then they'll usually add on top of that what they're looking for in terms of educational background and work experience. And then they've also got Peace Corps response, which is for more established professionals. And usually they're looking for a more specialized skill set. So somebody with an advanced degree or extensive work experience. And those opportunities are serving for months as opposed to uh, Peace Corps, the one I did, which was two years. Um, they've got a number of sectors, agriculture, community economic development, education, environment, health, and youth and development. Not every sector is, um, is available in every country, but sometimes they'll have a mix. So in the Philippines, we had environment, youth and development, and education. And then the Peace Corps mission is to promote world peace and friendship. And they've got three goals. Um, one of them has to do with just that the countries and agencies are requesting um, volunteers with a certain type of background that suits the projects that they're interested in. And then the other two are more about just building goodwill and understanding across cultures and the cultural exchange that the program is promoting. So I served in the coastal resource management sector. Um, like I said, this sector is not present in all Peace Corps countries, but it is in the Philippines. And a little bit about what we do there. Um, it depends on the priorities of the local government unit. So we're all assigned to a government office. Usually it's an agriculture office or it's like, um, like environmental management, environmental resource management office and off usually in a coastal area. And depending on what the LGU wants, we might do environmental education, we might do a needs assessment with uh, community members. Um, some volunteers are involved in marine, establishing marine protected areas or managing them. Some are helping with capacity building for fisher folk organizations. Some are helping with solid waste management. And that's actually what mine uh, service ended up falling into a lot. Um, my counterpart's background is in fisheries science and she's a fisheries tech, but in my particular site, they were, they had had Peace Corps volunteers before and kind of developed their CRM program a bit. And so they were looking to uh, focus on their solid waste management program. So. Our technical training was in habitat assessments though for mangrove seagrasses and coral reefs. So that was a fun training and we got to do some, some uh, snorkeling and some of us got to do scuba diving at our assignments. How I decided to volunteer, um, I liked the idea of government service from serving in AmeriCorps for a year showed me that I enjoyed it. And I was really excited to learn about a new culture and language. And luckily for me, um, what I didn't know before applying and getting accepted was that the Peace Corps, or sorry, the Philippines is very linguistically diverse. Um, some say that more than a hundred distinct languages are spoken there. So I had the opportunity to uh, study multiple languages while there. And my roommate during AmeriCorps was also applying to the Peace Corps at the same time that I was. So that was kind of an interesting experience. And she served in Fiji at the same time that I was serving in the Philippines. And she was awesome. And she was she came out, uh, flew out from Fiji to help us um, for with one of our grant proposals because uh, her background is in volunteer management. And that's what we were trying to uh, focus on for that grant proposal. 
And then over on the right hand side, that's my first uh, host family at my first site. So within the first year of arriving in the Philippines, we had a three month training in Cavite and Bataan. Those are two uh, provinces. And then I had my placement in Culaba Biliran at first. Um, unfortunately, there were some security concerns and I had to be transferred. But while waiting for that to happen, I spent two months in Manila, um, which was an interesting experience. And then finally, I got assigned to my site in Kulasi Antique. On the map, you can see, so those two green stars at the top, those are the training sites. And then the one on the right, the yellow star on the right is Kulaba, my first site, and the yellow star on the left is Kulasi, my second site. Um, Kulasi is in a region called the Visayas, and they speak the language Kinaraya. And in the lovely uh, woman in white uh, there in the top photo is my counterpart, Ma'am Alma Lisa Sandig. Um, and she's the designated officer of the Municipal Environment and Natural Resources Office where I was assigned. And then underneath that is my coworkers. And like I said, they were a really great team to work with. Um, not only did they have experience working with Peace Corps volunteers before I got there, I was their third volunteer. Um, while I was there, they got a fourth volunteer at the LGU. And then after I left, they got their fifth volunteer. Um, so they weren't totally uh, new to the game. And they also partnered with other organizations too, like GIZ, uh, the German organization. So we uh, identified some areas of interest for Mem Alma and then uh, developed projects together addressing um, some of those different areas. And one of them was ecotourism. So Kulasi is um, not heavily, I wouldn't say it's a heavily touristic area. It's somewhat close to Barakai, which is a major tourist destination, but it's about like an hour or, or an hour and a half south. They have three island barangays, um, which are like neighborhoods. And one of them, Maridison, is a is a local tourist destination. Um, Mount Majaas is the tallest mountain on the island, and it's a hiking destination. And uh, I had the chance to try and climb that with one of my fellow volunteers, and it was no joke. Um, we made it about halfway up, and then we we went back. <laughs> so, yeah, it was definitely um, a challenging a challenging trek. Um, with another the. Peace Corps volunteer who was assigned there simultaneously was a response volunteer. So she was there for about uh, six months. And we developed um, what she called a seven in one training. We packed so much into this training. Um, we had the leave no trace um, ethics. We had wilderness first aid, um, learning about local endangered species um, that we had partnered with different organizations who have those specialties to uh, deliver the training. And then the recipients were different tour guides. So either like geared towards folks going up into the mountains or visiting the islands. Um, and in the picture, uh, the gentleman holding the certificate is Sir Josue and he was a mountaineering uh, legend in the area. So it was pretty cool to, to meet him. And the second project that we worked on, which um, I would say we spent most of our time there, was plastic pollution reduction. The Menro office, while I was there, was developing their municipal solid waste management plan. And before I had arrived, they had passed an ordinance banning plastic bags in a lot of instances. And they were getting ready to pass another ordinance banning styrofoam, uh, disposable plastic utensils, cups, and straws. And so uh, they thought it would be a good opportunity to kind of strengthen their outreach in that area and strengthen their campaign, um, which we called Iwasan on Plastic, Avoid Plastic. And for this project, we organized some focus group discussions with business owners. Um, my counterpart, 
mainly and, and the office and kind of discussed what are some of the ways that the LGU can, can work with them to support them in complying with the ordinances. And um, out of those discussions, one of the ideas that came out was developing signs um, that that can that the store owners can put um, in their store that are going to have the municipal ordinance on it, um, because Kulasi is kind of a a transportation hub in northern Antique, and people are passing through sometimes that are coming from other municipalities and. Kulasi was kind of unique with this ban, so they wanted to have some kind of way to um, communicate that indeed there is a plastic bag ban and, um, you know, so the store owners feel like empowered to not offer a plastic bag or, or a straw or something to their customers who might be asking um, for one. Another thing that we did, um, we manufactured more than a thousand eco bags from uh, recycled flower sacks. So up there in the top left, we, we printed our slogan on them. Um, and then the other idea was that business owners could sponsor them. And um, so we would make like a little uh, screen for them to print their business logo underneath. And that was another way that we were able to get um, some, some buy-in. Um, and then we distributed those as part of the campaign. Um, another idea that came out of the focus group discussions was the use of uh, disposable cutlery and, you, and uh, styrofoam containers for catering events. And so we were able to start a reusable Tupperware lending program with some of the caterers. And overall, I think the response was positive and a lot of the business owners actually went above and beyond what was required by the ordinances. For example, one of them started to wrap uh, food in banana leaves instead of uh, disposable, uh, other disposable single use containers. And a remaining challenge is the, um, is the, municipal, the municipality is looking to address um, waste management for plastic sachets, um, which are those in the top left-hand corner, you can see um, the kind of colorful plastic packages. A lot of uh, shampoo, toothpaste, uh, like even coffee and other things like that are sold in the sachets. And there's not, they're kind of like light and they're easy to like blow in the wind or get into water or things. So, um, there's not a great way to recycle them and uh, my counterpart would really like to reduce the use of them if possible and um, one of her next initiatives is um, a refillable detergent station. She wants to pilot um, through the LGU where people can come and like get their, you know, bring a cup and get uh, shampoo or something in there, the amount that they want, but not have the sachet. Um, this piece my, my counterpart was especially excited about the we were able to organize and host an eco camp for high school students. It's unusual that a government office would host a youth camp, um, but we had a lot of help to pull it off from local high school teachers um, and other organizations. Um, the camps were funded by a Let Girls Learn grant, which is a US government program that was started by Michelle Obama. And we especially wanted to focus on uh, environment, um, environmental fields and STEM. So we had uh, the high school science teachers. Um, some of our camp counselors were students in fishery science from the local um, university. And we had uh, trainings and advocacy, leadership skills, and just a bunch of other things. We took students out to go and see um, the reef off the coast um, and it was a lot of fun. We had originally planned for just one camp, um, but it so happened that World Vision was working in the office above us and they, they saw the plans and they were kind of interested and they offered to sponsor a second one, a second round with their beneficiaries. So we were able to run it twice um, and learn a lot in the process. And you could see the 
the say no to plastic straw that's drawn in like a black Sharpie marker. That was what we used to make um, screens for a social marketing workshop. Uh, so students were actually able to like make their own designs and then print it onto their shirts. The next project was um, social enterprises. And this one was kind of interspersed between the eco camps and the um, plastic pollution reduction campaign. And our goals with these were to create an additional source of income, produce local items, and reduce waste. So we tried to organize a few pilot programs. Um, one of them was making shampoo bars, which is in the, the bottom left-hand corner. And our trainers for that were actually, uh, they were actually trained by a Peace Corps volunteer years before who, uh, who had done a soap making workshop. So we tried to kind of do a little bit of um, R&D and tweak the recipe and maybe it still needs a little bit of work, but um, we were able to run a pilot with that and the, um, and the trainees are high school students uh, supporting themselves. The second one that we had um, was paper charcoal. <laughs> and that one was um, not, as difficult to make, just taking like scraps of paper, letting them sit in water overnight and then squeezing the water out in the morning. Um, we got that idea from a nearby municipality that was making them. And after, the, after all the moisture has been squeezed out, they burn kind of slowly like charcoal. We did upcycled um, flower pots. So the really colorful one is actually strips of cloth that were dipped in cement and then put over a cup uh, to dry. That was just kind of a fun arts and crafts um, project. And then um, an agriculture class at the high school said that they wanted to start making those um, for some of their experiments. The cloth feminine products. Um, my counterpart saw um, a woman presenting on these on the local on the news. Um, and she's located in Manila, but um, we were able to connect with her and asked her if she'd like to come out and do a, a workshop. And she agreed and she came and she flew out twice to do the workshop. And um, she had done like this whole cost benefit analysis, how much money she saved and everything. So that was a cool project. And then finally, on the right, we had the bamboo straws. And those we received training from um, an organization called Made in IP, um, Made in Indigenous Philippines. And they wanted to be one of our customers. The bamboo is local. Um, it's just, uh, from what I was told, it's just a small size variety that wasn't going to grow into like the bigger size bamboo that can be used in construction. And the and this type of small bamboo was just being like kind of cut down um, off of people's properties to make room for other, um, other agricultural endeavors. So we were able to um, get the training from Made in IP and then make some of these bamboo straws. And this was another project that um, World Vision was interested in looking into and maybe seeing if they could possibly um, develop it into one of their ongoing um, community economic development projects, but would need to do some more research on it. And then the last piece that, that we wanted to focus on was volunteerism. And we, we had a lot of uh, volunteer driven activities. Um, we had a lot of help from YCLE, the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative, which is kind of a Philippines and US government um, blended organization for young leaders. And um, those two uh, women on the left side are members of YCLE who came out and helped with a lot of stuff at our events. Um, but they also try to get youth connected to 
like networking events and different other community development projects. They're able to um, write like grants and things like this through YCLE. The bottom right is a partnership that we did with a local church that was interested in as their ministry um, having this free drinking water stand that they would take around at outdoor events and set of bottled water able to being able to offer the free drinking water so that was a cool partnership we were able to connect with the church on and then in the top right um i think where we had most of our volunteering was for the crown of thorns starfish outbreak that happened in 2019 so the crown of thorns starfish are those um those creatures in the in the green nets on the beach and they're actually like under the water, they were like about the size of a dinner plate with a lot of spines. And um, they are naturally occurring, but they eat coral. And usually you would see them about one to five per hectare, but in Colossi in 2019 had more than a thousand per hectare, like stacked on top of each other. And we were kind of like, <laughs> SOS, we need help to, to uh, remove these cots and, and um, ended up re having with volunteers, um, removing them manually with tongs, taking them to the beach and then drying them just to get them off of the reef. And so we had to like develop a system to manage these volunteers who, who were showing interest from all over the Philippines and even outside of the Philippines. Um, because it ended up making the national news. And then those logos are just some of the other organizations that either helped provide training or funding or um, programming support at the eco camps. So since returning, um, a lot of Return Peace Corps volunteers take time to travel after their service ends. Um, and I traveled through Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, and Colombia um, before coming back to the US for about three months or so. Um, then I, I worked briefly with Green Heart International, which was a cultural exchange organization in Chicago um, until about midway through last year when I started working for Step and Company as a regulatory analyst on the biocides team. And something else cool that I didn't know was that there's a lot of return Peace Corps organizations. Um, and I was able to connect with this group called RPCV for EA, which is a, an environmentally focused group. So just recently been able to start doing some works with them. And then I kind of prepared this slide, um, how Calvin helped prepare me to serve in the Peace Corps. Not to say that somebody has to do these things, um, but I was just thinking back and reflecting on all the opportunities that Calvin provided to kind of like develop that interest or develop some, um, I don't know, skills that might help like, like language skills, um, but definitely not like, a requirement, for example, studying abroad. Um, Peace Corps takes um, a lot of folks from like really diverse backgrounds and experiences. Um, my group, for example, uh, my group in the Philippines was of about 70 people. Um, a number of them were recently graduated from college. Some of them were retired. And then we had like everything in between. So it's really like a lot of opportunities um, to serve at different like stages of life. But yeah, I would say living on first Van Rieken and the living learning community where I was originally introduced to LNT and Leave No Trace, um, the research mentor experience in FIRES, which was kind of like um, a little bit of research and a little bit of just learning about like project management with a lot of help 
and support. Um, living in project neighborhood, the study abroad opportunities, and then language classes. And yeah, that's what I have. Um, feel free to connect with me. I put my contact information there. Uh, if you're interested in reaching out to other Peace Corps volunteers and hearing about their experiences, um, I wasn't sure if folks might attend who were interested in possibly applying to the Peace Corps in the future, but I would highly recommend talking to other returned Peace Corps volunteers. And um, so I put the RPCV for EA site on there. There's like ways to get in contact with them or they also post blogs. Um, so if you're just curious about what their service was like, um, a lot of them have an environmental focus and then sometimes they post blogs about what they're up to now. So you can kind of see, you know, how their service impacted them years into the future, some, for some of the members decades into the future, which is really cool. And yeah, that's all that I have. Any questions? <laughs> I could stop sharing, I guess. There we go. Well, thank you so much, Caitlin, for giving us that overview of your experience. And I know I've got quite a few uh, questions. Um, there's applause going on right right now. You might be able to see a few of those uh, applauding hands going up on uh, on people's uh, um, icons there on the screen. Um, there's a couple of way, ways for everybody to ask questions. Uh, if you want to put your questions into the chat, I'll keep an eye on that and I'll relay those questions. Um, you can also simply turn on your video and unmute yourself and ask uh, those questions. We've got a really nice sized group for being able to have some conversations uh, right now. Um, I'll start off the questions. One of the things that I was really struck by when you were describing all of your experiences is what a large variety of things you um, you had to do. And I wondered kind of how that all fit together. Was it one project after another project or were you often working on several projects simultaneously? Um, did it feel like you had enough time to really get into into projects i'm just curious about all of that yeah um so the by the time i arrived in kulasi it was about i would say april so i started in in june with our training of 2017 and by the time i arrived in kulasi it was maybe already april of 2018 so we knew that there wasn't going to be the full like two years to complete the projects and um, my counterpart kind of helped to accelerate those a lot um, I would say we a lot of the planning and ideas and things were already developed by my counterpart um, and so what I mainly helped with was writing the grants um, which we could apply for through uh, Peace Corps and they were USAID grants and then um, we started the the plast the anti-plastic campaign we called it project first probably a couple months into service um, which is unusual because usually um, they wouldn't let you start a project say I had started at my first site um, back in like September of 2017 uh, I wouldn't have been able to start a project for probably at least six months because they want to give you time to just get to know people in your community, get to know your coworkers and your counterpart and and kind of your office and just, you know, even like learning the language and stuff takes so long. So <laughs> um, yeah, we had like kind of an accelerated, um, schedule and then about March of the next year we started the eco camps so the eco camps were really condensed and um, yeah I would just say it wouldn't have been 
possible without all of the help we were receiving from like other organizations that came in and had already like completed the programming planning side of things because we asked like an organization that does camps to come in and help with our camps. So um, a lot of the like organizing work was done by our office. And I'd say like the, the main like brains behind the operation is my counterpart and other um, members of my office. But um, having all those other people involved helped us to speed it up. I don't know if that answers your question. But. It does. It certainly gives me okay. a fuller, fuller <laughs> picture of what you were doing. And um, my, my follow-up question, I think, might head in the, the direction also of you just having a large variety. But I was wondering whether the intent during the Peace Corps was that you start new initiatives that people can carry on with after you leave? Or is it more of an intent that you carry out projects that are started and finished um, during your time or that you keep things going that people have started uh, before you? To me, it sounds like you did all of that, but was there kind of a focus that the Peace Corps has? Yeah, um, I think it can end up being all three of those. Um, I know during our training, Peace Corps stressed like sustainability and um, having like that buy-in and having a, a plan because two years is like a short amount of time in the big scheme of things. So having some plan about who might be able to take over the project and keep developing it after the Peace Corps volunteer leaves. And even going back to the beginning, just making sure that there's like significant interest in it that it's not just the Peace Corps volunteer who's interested in doing it and then once they leave it's kind of like done um, but yeah I would say all of those especially at this site because they had so many other projects going on from Peace Corps and other organizations um, by the time I got there it was kind of like in the middle of a lot of action already um, but every service is is different um, some folks didn't write any grants. Some Peace Corps volunteers didn't write any grants and they used, um, they worked on projects that were funded by their organization. Um, all of the CRM volunteers were located in local government units, but some of the, all of the education volunteers were in schools, so their projects looked different. And the children, youth and families volunteers, a lot of them were located in um, nonprofits. So they might have helped in other ways, but yeah, it really depends. <laughs> and how did you pick the direction that you were going into? Was that based on your background and your interests that you picked um, this sector and that you also ended up in coastal resource management? Yeah, um, so when you apply to the Peace Corps, um, you can select, you can kind of see the job listings for different countries and what's open at the time that you're applying. And then you can select, I think, three options. So I just searched for environmental. Um, and I kind of was able to read the job descriptions. And I think I applied for one in, um, one in like Asia Pacific region, one in uh, Latin American region. And then the third option, which you're allowed to pick is just like, put me anywhere. So I picked that option too. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think they tried to match the applicants with something that has to do with their background. And I was really interested when I saw this because I saw there was like a little bit of the environmental education, which we did a lot of in AmeriCorps, but also the coastal. Um, it just sounded really intriguing. <laughs> and they have like a, this joke kind of slogan, like I, it's like 99% above land or something. So I think like, um, and I was imagining too, like, oh, I'm gonna be diving and like snorkeling and all the time, like doing stuff, you know, with, in the coral reef, but a lot of the work that the CRM volunteers end up doing is like organizing stuff on land with the government unit, with like the Fisher folks organizations or with schools and things like this. 
Um, some of them did a little bit more of the technical side of things with the habitat assessments, if that's what their site wanted, but it just depends. And were you disappointed that you weren't scuba diving the entire time? Um, no, I really liked my assignment in the end. I really enjoyed um, what we were doing and just thought it was interesting to learn about something new. And my counterpart did make it a point to get me scuba diving and helping to take out the crown of thorns starfish towards the end. So that I thought was really nice of her. Yeah. I do not want to monopolize all the <laughs> questions. And uh, Professor Sterling has a question, has three questions. Oh, OK, go ahead. <laughs> And he needs to unmute himself. Oh, do I have to? Do no, that? no, no, oh, okay. no. I was just <laughs> joking. Um, so, yeah, um, try, trying to play charades with you. Good to good to see you. Thank you for coming and talking, Caitlin. This was a real treat. I have uh, a couple of questions that are sort of in, oriented towards that sort of land marine interface, but uh, I guess thinking about general health of the oceans there. And so I, I'm sure you got some, some look into these things, but for one, I know in, in many parts of the world, uh, mangroves are, are not faring well. And part of that, maybe even a major part of that is the conversion of mangrove coastal areas to things like shrimp fisheries, mm. basically aquaculture. Did you get a chance to see much of that? Is what, do you have a feel for what was going on in that part of the Philippines? I'm um, sure it goes on in the Philippines but to a large degree. Yeah, unfortunately, I would probably have to just say the same. I mean, we did learn about it in our training mm -hmm. and I, other volunteers were doing mangrove a little bit more yeah. geared towards mangrove assessments and yeah. um like mangrove health. I was able to help another volunteer do an assessment, but we didn't do very much of that at my site. Yeah. Yeah. Just curious. And another question is a little bit like that, but I know since you worked on the Crown of Thorns Sea Star, you got to see some coral reefs. So what do you understand about the sort of overall health of coral reefs in the Philippines region? Are they faring poorly there like they are in a lot of other places in the Western Pacific? Um, I would say, yeah, it's, it's, it's like a variety. Um, for sure, overfishing is an issue there, um, as well as, corn, I mean, crown of thorn starfish outbreaks wasn't just happening in Kulasi. No. It's happening all over and becoming yeah. more common. So, um, yeah. Those are some of the threats, I would say, as well as different, um, some of the volunteers focused more on like discussions about different types of fishing practices. So like, I don't know, bottom trawling, for example, yeah. versus hook and line versus, um, yeah, just other, you know, which ones are going to be more sustainable in the long run versus which ones yeah. are quick to get a lot of fish right now, right. but eventually not gonna support the fisheries, so. Historically, the epitome of that last approach was dynamite fishing. Exactly, where You yeah. just threw bombs overboard and basically stunned or killed everything that swam and then harvested it all. And that was really nasty on coral reefs. And it's still done in parts of the world today, yeah. Yeah, and that's definitely, that's going on there too. Um, they have like, um, I think a lot of communities have this group called the Bantai Dagat, which is like an organization that kind of looks for violations um, because dynamite fishing is illegal. Obviously very destructive. Yeah. Yeah. But another question I have is just kind of a question out of curiosity. While you were there during those couple of years, Major monsoons or typhoons, I guess there'd be typhoons, major typhoons struck the Philippines. And uh, of course, the 
the, the islands on the that face the east towards the open Pacific mm. probably got the worst of that. Did one come anywhere close to where you were? Yeah, there was one that actually at my first site right before I left, there was there was one um, that hit the eastern because my first site was on the more eastern side. Right. And so we yeah, we did have one. I forget what category it was. I know that President Duterte came out um, to kind of like do an assessment. So I think it was quite, we were missing power and um, like cellular connection for days, I would say. And one of the more difficult parts was that the bridge that, so like Beliran is a smaller island province that's connected to Leyte, the bigger island by a bridge and the bridge went out so the bigger island has like the big city and um, a lot of people are traveling in between there quite frequently. You, you mentioned an interesting word in that conversation and that's the name of your president. Do I dare ask a question? I mean, the Philippines president, right? Do I dare ask your, uh, your uh, three sentence evaluation? He's um, controversial for very good reasons. Right. Yeah. 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 I saw a lot of support for President Duterte while I was there. And I'm, yeah, we're not allowed to express political views as Peace Corps volunteers. That's what I figured. Um, because yeah, it's not good. a part of our, yeah. it, it's not a part right. of why we've been allowed to come into the country. Right. So, yeah, okay. I didn't really do much uh, talking about that. Yeah. Forget that question. <laughs> I, I have one other comment that actually is, is only sidelong addressed to you, and that is that I see Natasha Stridehorse's name up on the screen. So if she hang, if she can hang around till after we're all done with the conversation, uh, it'd be fun to just ask her how she's been for the last couple of years too. So yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, yeah, this is thank wonderful. You and uh more people, Calvin, need to hear that, need to hear your particular talk, not just a generic Peace Corps talk, but uh, we taped this, right? Yes, it's being recorded. And yeah. I, I'm thinking that will not only be useful for people who uh, could not be here today, but I'm thinking future students in future years who are yes. interested in the Peace Corps, this would yeah. be very useful. It's great. It's great. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's why I put my um, contact information on there too, in case anybody wants yeah. to. That's even why I thought to put LinkedIn because like email addresses change, but that's not likely to change. So yeah. <laughs> that yeah. might be a good uh, way to find me if anyone's yeah. interested in, in talking more. Um, I see a question about funding for the Peace Corps. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, if you, so if you want to maybe repeat the question too, Caitlin, and then, uh, then answer it. Sure. Uh, it says, I'm curious about funding for the Peace Corps. I understand it's based on volunteering, but how then are you able to sustain an income for oneself? So they call it volunteer, but we do have a stipend. Um, so it's not the type of volunteering where you have to raise your own um, money to live off of while you're there. And then the stipend is adjusted to the cost of living in, in the it's on like a countrywide basis. So it was kind of interesting how it got distributed depending on what your job was, whether you were in education or at the LGU or whether you were in a bigger city or in a very remote area, the stipend was gonna do different things for you, but it's enough to, um, I would say for everybody, for nearly everybody that I know to, um, buy their, to afford their rent, um, food, transportation. And then every time there's a training, Peace Corps funds, every time there's a training, like for example, in the Capitol, Peace Corps will fund us to go there too. And they'll fund our accommodations and everything. So at the end, you get a readjustment allowance, um, which I think for me was about $7,000 or so um 
and you can use that when you come back and are looking for a job. Um, some people use it to travel during that prime time, primo time after the Peace Corps when you may not have a job lined up. And so you're kind of, and you're already over there. So you're figuring why not? Um, yeah, that's how, that's how we did that. Um, other jobs outside of the Peace Corps are not allowed um, while one is serving in the Peace Corps either. So people were, some folks were like asking about, oh, can I have like my job online while I'm a Peace Corps volunteer? But that's, they don't technically allow that. Do I remember correctly that there is some student loan deferment? So while you're on Peace Corps, your loans do not come due? Yeah, I think that this depends on the type of loan that it is. And I'm not like super well versed in how it works, but I know that um, for some folks, they got adjusted to their, I guess, salary. And then I think in some cases, Peace Corps is also able to pay that, or the US government is able to pay that adjusted amount while you're a Peace Corps volunteer. But I would definitely uh, ask somebody with a little bit more knowledge of the technical aspects of that because I know it was kind of it seemed a little bit complicated for some to figure that out but there were ways that folks deferred their loans or just didn't have to pay at least their student loans while they were Peace Corps volunteers and they also allow you to if if for example like you have something come up while you're a Peace Corps volunteer that's an emergency, they allow you to, um, under some circumstances, take from your readjustment allowance while you're there. Mm -hmm. So like if you have a family emergency or something and you need to get home, um, you might be able to apply to withdraw from your readjustment allowance to allow you to do that while you're still serving. Are there other people who have questions? No other questions? <laughs> well, maybe I'll, I'll uh, finish off with one last question. If you had to think about your, your personality, your qualities, and maybe recommendations for other people, what, what would you say? So if, if there's a student right now who is thinking, would I be good at the Peace Corps or not? What would you say are kind of the most important um, things that somebody would need that they could look at themselves and say, yes, I'm adventurous or yes, I'm detail oriented or um, what, what would your recommendation be? Oh yeah, sure. Um, for me, I think it would probably be like flexibility and adaptability number one <laughs> because even when you apply and the job description is there it could it could change um, from what was written there or if, if you're imagining like a certain site in your head you don't know what exactly your site is going to be until you get there you get through three months of training and then they assign you and like all these other factors that just make it a really um rich experience but also like very different for every person so I think it's hard to um predict what exactly it's going to be like so flexibility would be one and then um um yeah I think just like willingness like I don't know to collaborate and um cooperate and kind of especially like listen and patience, <laughs> um, patience would be up there too. Cause um, I think a lot of things take longer than people think they're gonna take or, or they get really, really excited personally about this idea, but then there's like no support or even you like get excited about this event that you've organized and then nobody shows up. So just being able to kind of like move on past that and like, talk to other people and be like, what do you think went wrong? Like, do you have suggestions for me um, how to change this and like not taking it personally because 
for all the like meetings you set up that nobody goes to you know eventually you know hopefully somebody people do show up and then stuff kind of starts happening <laughs> yeah that's great well thank you so much for preparing the the talk for spending this time with us for answering questions I'm going to invite uh, the audience to maybe turn their videos on and, and give you a visual round of, of applause uh, right now as we uh, thank you. And you can see some of the faces who have been appreciating what, what, you've, uh, what you've done. <laughs> so um, so I, I'm going to formally end the, the seminar, but those who want to stick around for kind of that uh, you know, in the hallway type of conversation, please do uh, stick around and that conversation can go on. Sure. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. It's nice to see like there's some interest and again, feel free to reach out if you think of any questions later. Mm -hmm.